do you know for certain in life? As we look at God's word, what does the Bible tell us that you as a Christian can know for certain? And so we're going to read together as we look at 1 John, the closing verses of 1 John chapter 5. And we read this in verse 13 onwards. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked for, uh, what we asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray. And God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who has been born of God keeps him safe. And the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Well, as we come to this passage, we are given here the closing words of John, the beloved apostle, as he gives us the very purpose for this letter that he's written, 1 John. And he tells us the reason is that you might know certain things for sure. Did you hear that word? No, no, no. Coming out over and over in this passage that you might know. There's an Arabic proverb I came across. It says, he who knows not and knows not that he knows not. He is a fool. Shun him. He that knows not and knows not that he knows not is a child. Teach him. And he that knows and knows not that he knows is asleep. Wake him. And he that knows and knows that he knows is a wise man. Follow him. Well, that's what we want to be today, is wise. That we might know what we know as we read God's word. That we might know what God has said about you and to me. You know, there's many things we know. I, for instance, hope you know your cell phone number. I uh, also hope you know, for instance, what your bank balance is. Maybe there's enough in there, or maybe you know it's very tight. Uh, maybe you know who your family is, uh, even if they might tease you that you're adopted. Uh, but do you, you, there's some things that we know for certain. Well, here we are told some things that we can know for certain spiritually. John here gives us four main no statements. Things that we can know with a certainty. And John writes to remind us that you should know for sure these things as a Christian. So often as Christians, the devil would have us be uh, blind, would have us be lost. And many Christians perish for lack of knowledge. But God wants you to know something, that you have a, a deep and sure knowledge about things in this day and age. And so what are the things that you should know for sure as a Christian? That's what we need to look at today. And so John writes to strengthen you and me as believers. He writes to help us when we doubt. The devil does attack us with doubts. But when we keep doubting and turn away and fall away, then we're in great danger. When we turn doubt into disbelief, here we are reminded, hey, before you fall off that precipice of doubt, come back and know what you know in these days. And so John says the first thing that you can know 
is that you can know for sure about eternal life. You can be sure of your eternal life. Verse 13 tells us the very reason. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know that. We who believe in all that the name of Jesus represents and means, that he is the Savior, that he has come to save you and me from our sins, as you believe that he is the Son of God, that he is all-powerful as God and able to save you, so as you rely on Jesus, he can save you. You believe and you have put your total trust in him. And as you've put your total trust in him, you rely on Jesus moment by moment and day by day. And because of that, you should know intellectually, deep down in your heart, you should know in every single way conceivable that you have received eternal life. And that while doubts may assail you, God wants you to know that he has saved you. That now you have the gift of eternal life in the present tense. That now you live a new type of life that will go on even through death into eternity. Now, some people have said to me, but Daryl, aren't we being presumptuous uh, to claim to know that we have eternal life? When I visited people that are uncertain of their relationship with God. That's one of the things that I've often been asked. But aren't we being presumptuous? Uh, some people said, well, you cannot know for certain. Well, you can know for certain what your cell phone number is. You can know what's in your bank balance. You can look at it. And here we can look at God's word and know for certain whether we have eternal life or whether we don't. And so the answer is no, it's not presumptuous. For believers... There can be a certainty about our eternal life. Yes, that certainty comes with a humility. We don't boast and brag and rub people's noses in it. But we don't exclude anybody. But we do know for sure. And God through John specifically says in this passage, uh, in actual fact through the whole Bible, that you might know that you have eternal life. And what's... Why is that important? Well, you, you need to know that you have eternal life because if you have received the gift of eternal life, you now can have a boldness to approach God. You can have the assurance to go before God and ask him for anything that you need. Think of it this way. If you wanted to get something done from the state president, if you went to him and you walked up to him, more than likely his bodyguards would block you unless you were family or friend. He would not allow you anywhere near him. You couldn't approach him with any of your requests. You'd probably have to write to some junior official. Think of the electricity problems we're having in our area at the moment. You can't write to the state president to fix your electricity. He would refer anything that comes his way to those way down the chain below him. Well, we, if we have eternal life, have confidence to go to the very top, to God himself, the Lord of the whole universe, and speak to him. That's what verse 14 clearly says. It says this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so we literally have freedom of speech before the king of all kings. While we cannot say what we like in front of our own president, we can speak to God our father about everything. We have been set free from sin because of eternal life. And we now have been forgiven of all our sins. And we can ask anything, notice, with this one qualification, that it might be according to his will. In other words, every prayer is a variation on that prayer that we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. In other words, your active will, your dynamic will, your perfect will be done. And so we can pray. We can pray for the electricity. We can pray to the king of all kings who is way above any state president. And we can ask him to intervene, to change people who are corrupting the system, that have uh, been bringing down our electricity supply. We can speak to the God of all the universe about our needs here. 
and know that he will change either us to make us patient or change the situation if that is his will. And we know that he is at work in every nation, in every situation, for our God is in control. And so we pray. Prayer then is a sense of rolling up your sleeves, saying, Lord, this needs to change. Start with me. Change me and change these situations that are around us. And so no matter what the need is, we can come to God with our needs. But when we have eternal life, we have the confidence and the boldness to approach God in prayer. So maybe if you're battling with prayer, the question is, is do you know that you have eternal life? God wants you to know that for certain. But there's another thing that you can know, a benefit of being sure of your eternal life. Verses 16 and 17 are an example of prayer and how God answers those prayer and how that uh, answer is given. Now, I must tell you, verses 16 and 17 are, are, is a difficult passage. It is hard to work through, and we may not be able to dig as deep as we'd like to in this message. But simply put, it simply points out that prayer should not be preoccupied with ourselves, but it needs to be focused on others. We are to not simply be pleading for what we need, but interceding for the needs of others. We should pray. For wayward Christians, it speaks about here. We need to be asking God. Asking then becomes our part. Have you noticed how many uh, Christians, especially those that are weak in their faith, that are stumbling along, have fallen? How many Christians their love has grown cold during this COVID crisis? Maybe tucked up snug in their house, they've forgotten that what they take in also needs to be given out. That love needs to flow through them and not simply into them. And so they are not giving God his uh, due in these days. But when you pray, you are playing your part in asking God to do his part in their life. You especially pray for those whose sin does not lead to death. In other words, those who are slipping Christians, they're Christians, they, their salvation is sure, but they are, are growing cold. They're in danger of being chastised, of being disciplined by the Lord. Uh, those who are slipping into unwitting sins, they've started with a little bit of this and a little bit of that, maybe pornography here and attempted to adultery there, and the, the slide is downward. You pray for them. You see, John here speaks of sin that leads to death. And there has been much debate about what that sin is. Notice in the singular, there is one sin that can lead to death. And it probably refers to the deliberate refusal to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. It's that refusal to believe that He is God, that we need to follow His commands. It's the failure to love our neighbor and love our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's when we deny that Jesus is God, and so we ignore him, and we live for ourselves. That then becomes the denial of the Savior, the, the convicting of God's Holy Spirit. It's like Jesus spoke about that sin against the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. And when we stop listening to the Holy Spirit, when we stop listening to him, and he convicts our conscience, when we stop listening to him, uh, when he reminds us that, hey, there is a judgment day coming, when we shut the Holy Spirit down in our lives, we do not listen to our conscience, our conscience has become seared, as the Bible says. In that moment, we sin with the, uh, the, the ultimate sin, because we deny the only one who can truly forgive your sin and mine. In other words, all sins can be forgiven, except the one sin of denying Jesus is God, who alone can forgive us of all those sins that we need. And so there's one sin that we can negate all the other sins, and we need to be careful of denying Jesus. And so even in that so-called impossible case, that person that you think they can never change, well, remember that anything is possible with God. The only unpardonable sin is the sin of rejecting Jesus as the Savior. 
You see, if there is only one way, he is the way, the truth, and the life. If we reject him, then we are rejecting the only way that we can go. I remember well the story that Irene Samson told me. Irene was like a spiritual mother to me. She taught me all my Hebrew that I know that I might read the Old Testament. But Irene told the story how she used to pray every day as a a Jewish person that had come to faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Uh, Irene said she prayed and prayed and prayed for her family. And eventually God said to Irene, you're being a good Jewish mama. Yeah, you're nagging. (laughs) Stop nagging me and ask me to bless them. You know what? One by one, all of Irene's family came to know Jesus as the Messiah. I saw the same thing happen in my family. As I nagged God for many years that he would save my family, and one by one, even my dad, who was almost the last to hold out, came to faith in Jesus. God is faithful. He will answer your prayers. Yes, he asks us to be faithful, not to nag him, not to be a pain. You see, eternal life gives you that power to pray, to pray even for a Christian brother or sister who's sliding down a steep slow slope into great danger. You can pray and your prayers can enable and work in such a way that God can intervene in that Christian brother or sister's life. God then works in such a way that he can rescue each and every one of us. So what's the first thing you need to know? that you are sure of eternal life. But there's a second thing you need to know in this passage. You need to know that you are sure of your security in Christ. You see, Jesus will keep you safe. That's what verse 18 says there. It says uh, very clearly, it says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin, but the one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Isn't that wonderful? That as a Christian, if you have eternal life, if you're born again, and you don't make a habit of sinning, you've been careful to turn from those terrible habits that drag you down. And we all face the same temptations in life. We get the same attacks, but we don't deliberately keep on going back to do that which holds us back. We slip, but not persistently, because Christ keeps us safe. Jesus keeps us safe. I saw that my uh, one of my children was asking me, Dad, why don't you like to play Monopoly so much? Well, there's a few reasons why I'm not great on Monopoly, because one, it takes a long time, and it's usually a game we can only play on holidays. But secondly, when I play Monopoly, my old sinful nature so easily comes out. That scheming, even sometimes I confess cheating, uh, where, where I realize that my old sinful nature when I was lost comes to the fore. And I know that when I've played, I've had to go and ask people for forgiveness. And again, play again the next day and try and play like a godly person, not the way of the world. But Monopoly is designed in that sense, sometimes to bring out the worst in us. And that's what games do. Games teach us uh, much about ourselves. And yet Jesus is still busy with us. Jesus is busy with you and he's busy with me. And he will keep us safe. Even when we slip and we fall and we go into our, double, our old way of life. I always love that picture that Jesus gives us in John 10, uh, 27, 28 and 29. He says uh, that the Father has you in his hand and I have you in my hand. And you're in the double grip of God the Father and God the Son. And nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? That you are in the double grip of God. Nothing can wriggle in there or get you out. You you are safe. And that's what Jesus has called you to know. That you know that you have security in Christ. You see, not even the evil one, with all his power here on earth, can lay hold of you. The devil cannot harm you. Because you are in God's power. And that's why we pray daily, deliver us from evil. We ask God as we pray for that need and we have this assurance that we can be sure, we can know that you have security in Christ. Jesus will keep you. But you can know thirdly that you can be sure of your separation from this world. Verse 19 tells us this, we know that we are children of God 
and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. You see, we know that. We know we are children of God because Jesus has given his life for us. You and I have eternal life. We've been brought into the family of God. And yet at the same time, the whole world for whom Jesus died is also the whole world that is under the control of the evil one. Now it's interesting that the present sad condition of this world that is under control, that little word in the, the, the Greek language there literally means one that lies quietly under the control, that is unconsciously asleep. The world doesn't know that the devil has them in their grasp, in his grasp. And we need to remember that we are children of God. We have woken up to the truth. We need to be separate from the world. As Jesus said, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And so you and I need to act like we are separate. We mustn't be like the world. And when there's things that the world are doing that we know is evil, we need to have nothing to do with that. And we need to be light in this darkness. We need to be salt in a tasteless world. We need to be life in a, a place of death. You have eternal life and you can be sure that you are separate from this world. God has called you to be separate. But fourthly, in this passage, the last thing we need to be sure of is we need to be sure of our situation in the truth. Verse 20 puts it this way. It says, And we know also that the Son of God has come and that has given us understanding and we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Wow, what a powerful verse that is. We know that Christ has come. We are reminded at Christmas time that Jesus, God, came from the right hand of the Father. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, came and was born in Nazareth, in Bethlehem, conceived in Nazareth. And brought into this world. And now we have beheld the glory of God. The glory of the only begotten Son of God. And we can know what God the Father is like by looking at Jesus. And he has given us this spiritual sense. We just know it. He's given us a progressive insight as well. To diagnose what is truth. To know that Jesus Christ is the truth. There are many Things out there claiming to be true. Many philosophies often contradicting each other. But what does Jesus say? And does it fit with everything Jesus has said? Because Jesus is the truth. And his word he has given us that we might know him and the truth that he is. And so we can know him who is real. We don't worship a fictional character out of a cartoon or a story from long ago. We don't worship a false god. We worship God come in the flesh. And so we are in him. You are in Christ when you have opened your life to him. And in Christ you are in the real God, it says here. In ultimate reality. You don't have to uh, be afraid that there are some other realities that you don't know about. You are in the ultimate reality in Christ. And you then share in his life. And you are then in God by being in Christ. I had the privilege a while back of being involved in a wedding where it was away from the city. And I was invited to share in the preparation and in the service, lead the service and then uh, be at the reception. And it was quite exciting being there for the before, the, the main event and the after. And sometimes we get that privilege. You see, well, remember Jesus is preparing this world. For the great wedding feast of the Lamb and taking his people to be with him. And so this Jesus is the Son of God. And he is the eternal Son. Jesus is fully human like you and me. But he is also the Christ who is the Messiah. This Jesus is the true God. And the eternal life. When we live in Christ, we live and move and have our being in him. And so it cannot be more plainly said than this verse puts it. And in Christ, we have to do with God. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know what God is like? Not like the world 
paints him sometimes. Not like a, an old man with a long beard on a, on a cloud somewhere. You look at Jesus and you see who God really is. And he is the one that can save you. He can separate you from this world and he can secure you and keep you from evil. And that's our situation. That's who you are. Do you know that? You see, do you know for sure these things if you're a Christian? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? Do you know for sure that you have security in Christ? Do you know for sure that you are separate from the world? And do you know for sure your situation in the truth that you're in Christ? You see, God wants you to be sure. He wants you to be wise, to live worthy of your status as one who has received this incredible gift of eternal life. In other words, you need to live like a king's kid, like children of the king of kings, royalty. You are to behave in such a way that glorifies God, not like a wimp, not like a weasel, not like somebody that's conniving and trying to manipulate God to get what you need from him. God has given you the gift of eternal life, brought you into his family, healed you of all those childhood wounds and those things that have happened throughout your life. He is the God that is calling you to new life in Christ. And so be confident, be courageous for God, be prayer filled. Why? Because he hears you. He is your father and he listens. And that's why you must know who you are. And you must jolly well live like you are. Who God has given, made you to be. And that's why John says, keep yourself, guard yourself from any substitute for God. Anything that makes you take your eyes off Jesus Christ. Take anything that takes God's place. It ends this passage with, do not keep yourselves from idols. And our idols in these days are many and varied. Often materialism can be an idol and we look at circumstances and we take our eyes off Jesus. Maybe we've got animals or pets that are more important to us than Jesus. And that's a great danger. We are to take care of our animals, but never make them above Jesus. We must make sure that Jesus is central, that we care for people and we look after God's creation as faithful stewards. But we need to keep that order. If we invert that, we are falling into idolatry. If we make any person more important, any family member more important than Jesus, we have made them to be an idol. And Jesus warns us here, keep yourselves from idols. That idol will destroy you. Idols bring death and they will destroy you. And so Jesus calls you to be very careful. Any mental image of God, which the Bible does not teach, is an idol. Flee from that. Do you know that God loves you? Just God. That he has loved you before the foundation of the world, before your mother or your father even loved you or anybody else loved you. He has loved you and he loves you enough to discipline you. If you f go away from him, he will bring you back. And he has paid for your sin on the cross. He punished his son who became your substitute, who stood in your place. Your punishment was upon Christ. Why? That you might have this gift of eternal life. So don't look at anything but Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ alone, who is the author of your faith and the, the, the one who will keep you and the one who will finish this race as he strengthens you to keep running, to cross the finish line with Jesus. And so you should know for sure as a Christian that you have eternal life, that you have security, that you are separate from the world and that you're in the truth. Those are the four things you need to know. Know what you have got as a Christian. Or get what you do not have and that you need. Run to Jesus. If you know, oh, I don't even have eternal life, ask him now to save you. So let's pray together. Thank him and ask him if necessary. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this incredible gift of eternal life that you bought for and paid for on the cross for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you protect us from the evil one. 
that you have called us to be different in this world, separate from the world, and that you have given us the truth, that you are the truth. Help us to live and move in that truth. And Lord, there are so many idols around us, so many things that will lead us astray. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us in these days to know what we know, even more certain than our cell phone number and our bank balance. Help us to know you, the living God, that you are our God. For many of us listening to this, we can only thank you and praise you for your incredible goodness to us. But Lord Jesus, for some of us, we need to cry out, Oh, oh Lord Jesus, save me. Come into my life and give me this gift of eternal life, I pray and ask you. Forgive me all my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness, I ask. And now fill me with your spirit to live as your child, secure in you, separate from the world, in the truth. Oh Lord Jesus, Do this for me, I pray, as I ask this in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, who is God. Amen. Well, I pray that you have been encouraged if you're a believer. And if you're not a believer, that you even prayed that prayer at the end and you've asked Jesus to save you. And you even now have sensed, hey, something's changed. Jesus heard me and he's begun to work in your life. If I can help you in that journey as you follow Jesus, as you grow in your relationship with Jesus, please get hold of me. You can indicate in the comments below or you can email me at pastordrbc80 at gmail.com. But if I can encourage you, I'd gladly do that. And if there are prayer needs, do post it in the comments or email me as well. But may God bless you. And then to him who is, is our Savior. And has done everything to save you by dying on that cross. To him be all the glory and all the praise, both now and forevermore. Amen.